Well, good morning and welcome everybody to another edition of Rowing Chat. I'm Rebecca Caro and this month I'm joined by Mark O'Donovan. Mark, welcome to Rowing Chat. Thanks very much, Rebecca, and thank you for having me. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to tonight and I hope our listeners get a fair bit of knowledge and stories from what I have to say. So please tell everybody a little bit about yourself and your personal history in the sport of rowing. So I'm a rower from Skibbereen and I'm 27 years old. So I'm, I've been rowing since 2000. So I've been rowing 16 years and I've represented <clears throat> uh, Skibbereen for many of them and then I was representing different colleges as I went through and even Tideway Scholars over in England and I've, I've been around the place and so currently I'm training out of uh, the National Rowing Centre which is based in Inascara and we've got a great team set up here so <clears throat> I've, been, I've been based here since 2009 and I've, I have been doing a I was doing my, uh, my degree in Cork Institute of Technology, CIT, and I did a mechanical engineering degree at the time, and into full-time training straight away after that, and I had some good progress along the way, so that would have brought me into my under-23 age group, and then I actually took a year out further down the line and then that's when I did a master's in sports performance in the University of Limerick and I'm back down to the the National Rowing Centre in Cork which we call the real capital we don't like to associate Dublin as the real capital Cork, Cork people are rebellious that way so we're we're very proud of what we have and what we're able to produce down in Cork so that's uh, that leads me to here right now so I'm just working part-time and training full-time. Fantastic. Now, I first got to know you thanks to your blog, and you write about strength and conditioning for rowing. What was the inspiration behind starting that? <clears throat> it was actually a coach that I be I well respect inside in Monster Robbie, and where we were gained a lot of experience and he was <clears throat> he was head of the academy at the time and he was <clears throat> just working I was working alongside him just either lads or as the underage group so with all their gym sessions and some uh, pitch sessions as well so I was doing a lot of experience with Robbie and I was just trying to what how I could make myself better get my development going and he he always said he would always he always wanted to do a blog himself so <clears throat> he kind of ended up persuading me to do one and haven't looked back since i i know there's not um, a whole lot of information on it but it's continuously being added to it and it's it's rowing specific and a lot of it is from a science-based approach but also a practical base so it's not um, completely, it's it's uh, where what the what's being practiced in a high performance setup. And I think that is an enormous area of interest because those of us who are not in the high performance setup have and have never been there have no idea what it's actually like. So for me, the insight that I get from your writing and from the really good photographs which I compliment you on because a lot of bloggers don't use good photography. Thanks very much. I know I photograph well for my blog, all right, so <clears throat> uh, I'll have to thank one of the girls in the office here for, uh, I, I bombarded her to take a few photos with me there one day, Jesus it took a while, but I, uh, you know, I have a great collection so I can always go back to those photos so <clears throat> I can continue to do different things like rehab or just the main exercise so 
and try and show the good and the bad and obviously I want to try and show the good so hopefully my my views are or my pictures are showing what I'd like to call good posture and technique so and that's so important when someone is trying to learn something new particularly a physical thing having a clear picture in your mind of what the correct posture is is very very important so uh, any coaches who are listening I commend the blog to you. Do you want to just give the URL? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just have to get it there and go, so I don't get the wrong one. Well, Mark's just looking that up. Um, I will say that it's well worth going back to the very beginning of his blog in order to read the very first articles because quite a few of them run in a series. So the URL he's just put up is odonovanmark.wordpress.com. So moving on the theme of your obvious interest in strength and conditioning training with specificity for rowing. Uh, we've had a question in from Gary Anderson, who is from Wilmington, North Carolina, and the Cape Fear River Rowing Club. And he asks, assuming the use of complementary forms of exercise benefits the rower, which activities do you consider best for developing those large muscle groups which need this focus? <clears throat> so obviously if we're looking at the large muscle groups we want the best bang for buck and they're generally going to be uh, overall body um, orientated so we're going to be looking generally squat or the L deadlift you can't go wrong with them if you do them right you're pretty much hitting everything you want to be doing so they could be down in your core sizes whereas you can always add in <clears throat> so they're for, they're for the big muscle groups, so you'd always kind of want, to, if you're doing a three or four exercise, it just in one session, always have one upper body, so just add in the chins, because um, either have your palms facing towards you or else away, and you'll get a great, a great load, but it'll be very quick. So have, a look, have a look through the blog and I think I'm after covering the squat already. I should have some photos up on it and some coaching points on it. It'll be very hard to give a little bit of coaching cues because you'll have to be there with an athlete uh, to show give an error and then you have to give a cue to fix it. But I would, I would always stick to the squat or the and deadlift. They're, they're just your bang for buck exercises. You can always add in some sing leg work because always I know we're we're always pushing off one double leg at the same time. But you know when we're sweeping, we could all, and even some scholars they might be one leg dominant. So you do you would want to add in some single leg work, but it's the squat is what's going to get you strong more than a single leg exercise. Mark, what's Oriel? It's not a word I'm familiar with. Sorry, sorry. An Oriel is a Romanian deadlift, or as some coaches would call it, a semi straight leg deadlift. Um, it originated in um, Eastern European, obviously, with the Romanian. And it's uh, uh, <clears throat> your hamstring, your rear superior chain, so your lower back strings and it's with stability as well so it's quite important for those seeing as they rock over and it is we're getting quite a lot of sound interference can you turn your video off and see if we can get the audio quality up thank you so moving on, John Hill, who's in Oxford in the UK from Falcon RICC, has asked what relevance does the bench press have to developing a successful rower? 
this press isn't the be and end all of a rowing performance. Unfortunately, John's probably a little bit annoyed with that because he wants the uh, most athletes or coaches. They love staying on the bench press and it's not a true measure of strength. It may be for people who love the gym, but obviously rowing is driven by your legs. You do need a powerful or a strong upper body to hold what your legs are putting out. But I would stick to the basics of your, your squat, RDL, chins and deadlift. And the bench, make sure it's in there, but a supplement exercise and primary focus. Do you want to go into a bit more detail about other arm exercises? I get your focus on those core four. Um, so, obviously, with or likewise with our legs, we want to be going through um, single arm work as well as both arms at the same time. So, like we can do our bench press with the bar, or as we can do our bench press with the dumbbells, and it's obviously brilliant if we can add in dumbbells as well because we got that instability. So that would be a push and to do a push in a single arm row. You can always do a bent over row with the bar, which is both arms at the same time. But it, it, it always is great to switch up a program because variety is a spice of life and we, we want to get as well. <clears throat> so that would be a push and a pull you you could add in pressing as well over the head which could just be um, a, a military press or a dumbbell it could be half, you could do it from half kneeling fully standing a split stance or else seated so there's numerous ways of mixing up exercises but I will always have a variety of using both your legs at the same time and a single leg work and both your arms at the same time and single arm work just to get the most, most bang for buck and make sure the athlete doesn't become one side dominant, dominant whereas you would see in, I'm going to sweeping again, a lot of people who sweep are going to be a, li a little bit lopsided and I'd always see coaches going on coaching courses and some people will come that probably as they were never really looking after themselves when they were going in their youth and they're always on one side fixed so as either bow side or stroke side and then they have a little bit of a kink in the spine so they if they were able to look after themselves better or being given the knowledge to do a little bit more gym work and doing the right type of gym work, supervise and everything, they should highly reduce the chance of that ever happening. That's really clear, thank you. Now, earlier on, you used the word cues to explain ways of teaching weightlifting to rowers. Can you explain what, do, what is a cue? <clears throat> the cue? <laughs> Um, it's it's probably the art of coaching. Um, you must be teaching someone instead of telling what you visually want to see. You can sometimes cue them into uh, thinking about it differently. It depends on the type of person and how they respond to you. And everyone's has to be treated differently. Every individual different but if I would say an, an athlete during the squat for instance um, and <clears throat> they're I'm gonna I'll, I'll pick an easy one now so everyone can understand me so when an athlete isn't getting the full depth and actually sitting back on the heels at the bottom of the squat which we would like to see of the squat having the pressure is in heels more so than uh, being in the midfoot or 
towards your toes. So if you can see, if you could imagine they're, they're, <clears throat> they're going up onto their toes during their squat, but they, they can't register that that is happening, you, you might have a simple cue of sit back as if you're sitting on a chair and sometimes instantly it would change an athlete to reach out with their glutes as if they were trying to touch touch a chair and sometimes it fixes it, other times it doesn't and that's where you reassess and go with a different cue. That's really clear. So for coaches who are finding their message isn't getting across, experimenting with different cues may be a helpful way to overcome this. Absolutely. Myself, also being coached on water because I'm so uh, <clears throat> determined to uh, move well in the weights room, I'd be very body aware of my positioning. So my coach would always kind of uh, the oar as the bar in the gym and how I should be picking it up is where I'll be feeling it on, on a certain muscle or muscle groups rather than um, sometimes a different type of a feeling where someone might, someone might be feeling something better or not, not slightly better, but a, a different feeling of the water, whereas I sometimes would be better at feeling it through what muscles are working and what's not. So different people respond differently. So I hope that's a question. Wonderful. Now we're going to move on to a question that's come in from James from Boston in Lincolnshire. Sorry, Jason James. And Boston has asked about training zones. Now most listeners I'm sure are familiar with the concept of UT2 and UT3 or steady state as it was called in the old days. And what he asks is this, training at UT2 or UT3 feels too easy when sticking to appropriate heart rate zones. Is this right? S sounds like Jason is really gifted if it feels easy or if it feels too long. So I would count there and uh, we could always want to be like, Jason, if I want to you is is said most people, or some people call it LC long low distance, or as the scientific word is over threshold two says, someone should be but you're always able to clear the amount of lactate you're producing at it pretty much. So you'll, you'll never be producing more than 2.1 or 2.2 um, minimals of lactate. So I would suggest either get um, a physiologist in or else some some coaches may have them anyway and lactate analyzer and be able to check that that amount of lactate is being produced in the system so if it is feeling too light it may be that he's already adapted over a certain period of time since he got tested last so let's say he got tested in november december and don't was 150 to 160 on his heart rate beats and then he kept doing the long the steady state loads of miles over the winter and in february he's not going to have the same heart rate zones or they will have changed because of adaptation so you always need to kind of retest every every well i would just say every couple of months just to make sure you're not far out of out of sync, and if 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 it's possible, try and get in someone with a bit of knowledge. E either be a, a very experienced student; they love to do the work, or else try and go for um, a res 
or registered uh, physiologist. So talk me through, how do you test and establish heart rate zones? Because I understand that every athlete is different. And so if the coach is suggesting the, the zone range of 150 to 165 for all of the athletes, I'm guessing that could be incorrect. So how do you test for each individual's heart rate zones? You would have to do um, a, either a step test um, where you'd be, generally the protocol is six to seven stages and it's four minutes a block. And I think it's not seconds off the block. Um, I could try and check that out just to make sure. But like you, you would start off extremely, extremely light. It would be at a pace that would be under what you would be warming up at usually on a rowing machine or when you're going out on the water. So there'd be no lactate in the system. So you start off really light and then each increment would step up on wattage and then if you wanted to do the last one at max generally you can work it up but you kind of want to get a, a profile it's rising over those six to seven stages and it will give you you can correlate it with your heart rate and also you can start seeing where um the two your lactate turn point is, which is like four minimals, and that's where, when you pass that, you can't, you can't start clearing that as quick as it's being produced, but you also get great information of your um, threshold and, and your max and everything from a step test. The other way of testing it is just having a lactate analyzer or protocol of the six or seven stages of the four minute box is just doing um, let's say generally a lot of people may do 6k steady state um, 3 6k's and 90 second rest or else 3 20 minute pieces at steady state with 60 or 90 minutes rest and all you need to do is get it after each one Always take a prick from the ear because if you're taking it from the fingers, you're just going to bleed everywhere. So make sure if someone's new and come in, ask them, make sure they take it from the ear rather than the finger. That sounds like good advice. Now tell me a little bit about your own personal training because obviously you're in the Irish national team at the moment. Do you use heart rate zones for your training? Um, I would yes, yeah. I would very religiously wear my heart rate uh, monitor, and <clears throat> I'd always just be looking down. And it's quite handy just to have a guideline because there's a lot of variance uh, with day-to-day -day life and the time of day. And let's say you're stressed, it happens to everyone. So you got to factor in these these things and also a good one for um, lightweights or someone who may be uh, efficient if you're if you're quite low on calories or as you could say muscle glycogen if your muscle glycogen is low you won't be producing lactate um, or enough lactate to start going up to the, the 2.1 in the steady state so you will be pushing as hard as you can, yet nothing's happening. So that's you just get on machine or get out of the boat and recover. I always wear my heart rate monitor in, in the boat or on the rowing machine. And I find on the concept too, there's a great, they have great little heart rates that go onto the screen and it's a handy way of keeping keeping record of everything then when you have your break going on the screen and it's much easier to see that than a watch. Personal preference. 
Fantastic. Now, our next question is from Elizabeth Kowalki, who's in Rochester, New York, at the Pittsford Crew. And Elizabeth asks, do you include mental training with novices? And if so, how do you introduce it? And what do you find most effective for this kind of training? <clears throat> That's a very good question. And I've been working with a number of the time the element of something mental training. But, uh, <clears throat> If I was to implement uh, something for a crew, if you're working with novices, I would be of the I would be of the opinion just to make sure that they're doing the basics right, and you want to get get uh, the rowing technique, and you want to get them strong, and you want to get them fit, and make sure that they're able to eat right and recover properly. But if you're going to look at some mental training, nation would. A great place to start. So, if a if an athlete or a group of athletes can imagine, just even when you're going to a regatta or you're at home uh, in bed, um, or have just after a nap or before a nap, just start focusing on your race preparation, and trying to have it the same every single time. Then, when you get on the blocks, you know exactly what you're doing. Then you're going racing, and you know what kind of a plan you're going to, if, if something doesn't go to make sure that you're able to adapt to it straight away so that things don't get panicked and something's thrown out the window. You just got to be able to be adaptable to everything that's going to go on because you got to be able to control the controllables. It's a, it's a pretty big one really. And start with middle training. A lot of people do it and Sometimes it can calm people down and other times it can actually rev people up. So make sure if people get a little bit pumped up by it, don't do it before bedtime because you won't be able to sleep proper, properly. And we all know sleep is the best thing for you with all the growth release. It's the best tool of theirs. Mark, we're losing your audio somewhat. Um, can you, okay. Can you ensure you've got everything else closed down on your laptop? So for me on mental training, um, and fo focus is the number one thing that uh, I think novices find hard. Firstly, they find it hard to concentrate on a single thing for an extended period of time. And secondly, they find it hard not to over concentrate on three or four things at once. And so Elizabeth, when I'm coaching beginners, I do two things. One is I explain to them that it's really very hard to think of more than one thing at once and encourage them to do a focus for at least 10 strokes on one thing, maybe their squaring um, or their inside hand and to count those 10 strokes in their head I then ask them to try and row for 10 strokes without thinking about anything to clear the head and see if the movement pattern is still there at the end of 10 strokes. So then they come back and appraise whether the squaring is working. And if it is, then they can stop thinking about it for another 10 strokes. If it's not, they then take 10 strokes to think about it again. I particularly find women overthink what they're doing and that inhibits their ability to move. So having said that, again with beginners, I actually stop very frequently in the training so that they have time to not think about rowing and to relax the brain muscle before focusing and restarting. So that there's clear intense periods of thinking, and clear periods where no thinking or looking at the scenery or the ducks or whatever is encouraged. And in that way, you get them used to having a direct focus for short periods. And of course, you can lengthen that. 
Mark, what sort of mental training do you do formally as part of your own training with the squad? I would use uh, I would use the visual visualization myself. Um, I would find that very good, uh, and it's, it would be pretty much the only thing I would do if I was to visualize. I would generally just stick to vis visualization, and I I generally let that be the the dictator of my prep. And you do that with your whole crew, or just on your own? So while Mark's. Uh, audio is hopefully coming back. Uh, we just have a short break and some announcements. Road Perfect has started to stock an exciting new product. Have you got lots of apps for rowing on your smartphone that you can't use because taking the phone in the boat makes you nervous? The answer is at hand. Row Perfect now sells the rowing boat smartphone mount. This is designed to securely hold your phone while you row. Built with strong aluminium and two long Velcro straps, the unit attaches either to a wing rigger or onto the deck of your boat. Now you can use sensor apps in the boat. But remember, a secure mount is essential because too many vibrations give false readings. Hello. Can, these can come from something as minor as feathering the blades. So you don't want to have bad readings from your sensor apps. So get a rowing boat smartphone mount and secure the best environment for your phone apps in a boat. Go to rowperfect.co.uk forward slash shop and search for rowing boat smartphone mount. Now, I'm back with uh, Mark um, O'Donovan, who's an Irish international rower. Now, Mark, you were kind enough to tell me that this current season, you've had some personal disappointments in your rowing. Would you be prepared to share this with the rest of the listeners so that they see what sort of insight they can gain from a professional athlete? What's happened this season? So this season, it got off to a good start and we had a great number involved in um, a lightweight men's sweep, sweep group and I was one of them. And we had a bunch of athletes and we were training shoot and then things started tailing off and it started being pared down to the crucial members. and. It was in September when we <clears throat> got a, a four together and we started training a little bit and coming he, here and there together when we could and we started getting as much preparation as we could and trying to get the miles in and it was a little bit rough at the time and I suppose <clears throat> things started to smooth out. But coming into the new year we were we were getting much, much better and our direction was going very good <clears throat> and we <clears throat> we started targeting obviously Olympic qualification so that would be the European it's actually only coming up in two to three weeks now it's just before the Lucerne World Cup we were hoping to target that regatta and unfortunately we we started once we started racing and I our first major regatta which would have been World Cup uh, won in Varese in Italy um, things didn't go well and we kind of knew like we had a our performance was uh, the same as any any other any other day and it just was way off the pace and it's a hard thing to um, dive into but it's the reality of it's it's not going to happen, you know, it's like, so that's another Olympic, Olympic dream uh, gone. So trying to qualify for the Olympics and 
I tried to do it before in 2012. I was in a lightweight men's double with a Galway man, and we we missed out on out and that. We we were going through the season pretty well, but we didn't hit it hit the nail on the head. We when we were racing um, in that qualification regatta. So you know the places are pretty limited, but we didn't end up getting it. So <clears throat> last year we actually tried to get the this this lightweight men's fours project has been going really since two thousand and eight. The last bunch of um, Olympic athletes they all they all quit. So things are being built up over the years. And there's only two of us about to do the double in 2012, and we failed to do that. And then we're trying to get a four together ever since. And the amount of people we've had coming in, first, I was, I'm 100% positive we have the athletes in Ireland to do it. But uh, due to commitment or maybe uh, aren't able to produce. So... I'm, I'm in the now, so third or fourth year race will be looking to go on to world champs again at the end of this year. So, um, my last year's pairs partner, he's from Skibbereen, so you can't get a better man than a Skibbereen man. Um, so you never go away from your own hometown. So we'll be looking to. Race that again. This effort and even our not for us. We didn't provide goods and that was that. Tell us a little bit more about how the Irish National Rowing System is organised. You mentioned that you have a national training centre. Uh, how are you all full time athletes? Do you get paid? What happens? So there's a bunch of athletes here, and we're all full time. It's a big, massive centre built here, and it also is the home of the local club Lee Valley um, one man set it up and he built the whole place and we're very we're very committed to the man who did it I probably won't mention his name but they all know who it is anyone who does know we all train out of a great stretch of water and it's equipment of course and the gyms and just top notch and we would all train um pretty much on the water at eight o'clock and we'd either do our two or three sessions in the morning we could it may be split sessions uh, uh we we could generally be doing split sessions so we could be doing one or two in the morning and having a break in between and of course, and then having a good couple of hours of a rest in the evening and doing a further session or a weights session or, or else just off. So we'll always be split. And the other, the other girls and boys would um, be coming and going as well. So we would around the same time, but the coaches, will go with their boats, obviously, and that may be different directions rather than everyone going off in the in the one direction of holding hands. But we, are we all? Times when 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 it's needed. So, who's your current coach, and who are the other people who have helped you get to where you are now? So my current coach is Noel Monaghan. He's a previous lightweight rower himself. Um, he did very well for himself when he was rowing and he just came back into the system. He had been trying 
uh, decay one first, and before that, it wasn't so long when he was rowing himself. So he's he's our uh, coach, and he's just looking after and daughter Skib Skib lad in the pair, which is Shane. So he's he'd be he'd be the sole input of our boat and he would have been looking after the four when the four was around but that's no longer so that was that's cut and then we got <clears throat> the year was a funny year because it started off we had a great coach uh, John Holland that took uh, us up to Europeans European championships in a in a in the lightweight men's four and once again we don't have a great reputation at the moment uh, it flopped so we had to end it there and then so myself and Shane got back into the pair and were we were we were coachless for, for months and we went to Lucerne and we had the high performance director who he was too busy to do any coaching but he was looking after us with one of the other rowers, fathers, so um, have to have them look after us, but we had no coach, and then it was only eight weeks out from the World Championships is when we finally got a coach for uh, 2015, and his name was Sean Casey. Very well for us there. That's so, like Sean was the lifesaver that year. Oh, jeez. <clears throat> he was actually brought in to coach the heavyweight women's four. And um, we, we were asking, we needed a coach at the time. So uh, we pretty much got down on our knees and begged him to be our coach. And thankfully he did. So, and he did a great job with us, to be fair. He's based over, well, he was coaching Reading University over in England and <clears throat> I'm not too sure is he still over there or is he back home but I'd have I'd have a lot of respect for him whether or not he'd have a lot of respect for me after coaching me sometimes we're, we're coachables we go through so much equipment and so much uh, <laughs> so many coaches I'd know is there something wrong with us or is it the system but we won't answer that question Mm -hmm. Now let's talk a little bit about rowing in Ireland. We've got a question from Bill Atkins, um, who's in the USA, and he says, what can be done to keep athletes in the Irish team mix after university? <clears throat> so if we're to keep athletes in the team after, or keep athletes around or rowing after university is the first thing, get them get them training straight away, get them to join a, a local club, or even if there's an alumni um, of the university, get them to feed into so that they don't have time to think about parting and drink because we all, well, over here anyway, generally lose our best athletes to uh, nightlife. So <clears throat> if we can keep them rolling, fun competitive environment you'll have the best of both worlds if you make sure you find out what their goals and aims are would be another Yes, I do agree that knowing people's goals and aims can be a really useful way of keeping the focus. One of the things that most popular blog posts we've ever written is called Rowing and Alcohol. And it was written in response to a university rowing captain who said, how can I stop my crew drinking? And uh, the answer is you probably can't, but you can set expectations of behavior and have some uh, boundaries and um, we came up with a few suggestions, which I hope he found useful. 
One of the things that next question is from Geraint O'Sullivan, who's in Shoreview, Minneapolis, and he is at the Minneapolis Rowing Club. Now he says, as a diehard Irish rowing fan, without much to cheer about in recent years, what are the prospects of the Irish crews going into this Olympiad? Well, I'm sure Geraint is a fine, um as a diehard of rowing with a fine Irish name like that. So I, I suppose that's the million million dollar question Gerard's asking there is uh, how how the boys and girls will currently we have a lightweight men's double um and also the women's single which will be going to the uh, European qualifiers uh, soon so um, I don't know Gerard but I hope they they get what what they want and get what they deserve and hopefully that that could be some medals because it it's an absolutely amazing just to see if there's any bit of success in in rowing at all even the just what it does to not only other teammates, it gives them belief, but also other club club rowers and athletes. You suddenly become <clears throat> you become a role model for them, and people will start looking up to you and start doing what what you're doing. And I hope that they do as good as they can because it's going to it's going to do our nation proud and also their family and friends. So I I can only wish wish them the best and. Let's home. Let's hope they they can manage a medal. So you know, it's never it's never out of question. You know, we've got some good crews. So we'll uh, we'll light we'll light a few candles as as they'll say at home. I think you'll light a few candles in people's hearts as well. If you get any qualifiers, it will be brilliant. Really, really encouraging. And for anyone who has ever watched rowing live, you can be sure that the Irish fans are well worth sitting next to because they're always very, very enthusiastic and huge fun. That would probably go back to the rowing and alcohol. So our last question comes from Brian Purcell from uh, Broxbourne in Hertfordshire, Broxbourne Rowing Club. And he asks, what is trending as new to enhancing performance? Now, that's, that's a good question. And uh, a new things coming Well, say um, what because because if you can do the basics for comp much better than adding in all the fancy stuff. So if you can just collect the data that you would need, be it uh, in strength and conditioning terms, let's say a three rep max and a counter movement jumper if it's in rowing terms you want to collect like a morning monitoring which would have your heart rates your mood your your perceived uh, sleep your body soreness um, and your your previous training sessions and then your time and multiplied by intensity you can get a stress and that would be as scientific as let's say most people would need to go because there's a lot of studies done on, let's just say heart rate variability. Even if uh, Brian starts looking into heart rate variability, one of the main um, key people who actually does all the, publishes all the articles for it, the RPE on a, on a basic Google Sheets, um, you, you very easily to set up and it's kind of perceived effort um, 
so it's not it's not very it's not very invasive more than and time consuming because once they're set up it's it's there basics is pretty much what I would advise and what I've been advised to as well and do it right well that's extremely clear so I'm going to thank Mark for his time it's been delightful having a current athlete uh, from a national team on rowing chat I think you are a world first with us Mark and uh, look forward to our next rowing chat next month please go into iTunes and give Rowing Chat a rating. Uh, we really, really value any feedback you may have, and you can send that to info at rowperfect.co.uk. Follow us on Twitter. We're at rowperfect. And, of course, subscribe to the Row Perfect newsletter. Now, Mark, please let the listeners know where they can get in touch with you if they have any more questions. So I suppose uh, my my Twitter account is at so it's a uh, M Anthony R C so or else if find me Marco Donovan I I'm just there a picture of me in a boat or else uh, my email is Mark dot O'Donovan at Rowing Ireland dot ie and I'll get back to anyone who gets onto me and uh, I'll tell you. I'll give you any information that, and um, I'm, fr I'm free to be contacted pretty much. So thanks very much for having me and I really appreciate it. And I, I like being one of the first. So that's always good. Brilliant. And I apologize for some of the sound quality during this broadcast.